The way software is developed, delivered, and maintained has changed. It's continuous and constantly moving forward. It demands measured progress. Are you passionate about DevOps? You know it's not about the destination, it's about the journey. So let's go after it. Are you DevOps driven? Then let's go. Hey, yo, welcome to the new show. It's about DevOps and driving, don't you know? I know that was terrible. This is Scott Moore and thank you for joining me on my new show, DevOps Driving. If you're DevOps driven, this is the show for you. Many of you know me from my other show, The Performance Tour. And while we're not abandoning that, we're expanding our topics to talk about things around how software is being delivered in today's modern IT, things that will help developers, quality, performance, and operational engineers. So I'm in search for those people who have been there, done that, and maybe cut the trail a little bit. So this show you can consider a, a little bit of a bridge between performance and DevOps because this particular episode, I wanna talk about where we've come from in terms of quality and performance. And for that, it takes me to Dallas, Texas, where I'm gonna meet with my friend, Paul Grizafi, who has been there and been doing this kind of as long as I have. I wanted to find out like, where are we at? How far have we come? And maybe what's missing? And does he have any advice for us? Let's go there now. So when we talk about quality and performance, um, I just wanna talk about well, how far we've come or how far we haven't come and your ideas on maybe what we're missing. So sure. before we do that, why don't you tell our audience just how awesome you are and who you are? <laughs> I'm terrible at this part, but I'll do it anyway. So I am Paul Grizafi. I'm a senior automation architect with Vaco, uh, where we are working to start offering premium QA offerings and QE offerings and helping everyone just be more um, effective and more efficient at their jobs when they come to looking at quality. Now I think of performance as an element of quality. It's a characteristic of quality. I, we used to have, in the simpler days, the three-legged stool of quality, uh, functional performance, and configuration management, and then we added security, and then the stool just kept getting more and more. <laughs> a lot of legs on that <laughs> yeah, stool, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's, a, it's a very sturdy stool. Um, you mentioned QA and QE, quality assurance and quality engineering. Make the distinction for everybody out there. So it's really kind of, um, and Michael Bolton would kill me for this, but it's really sort of up to the, the user to make the distinctions there. A lot of times when we go from the notion of quality assurance, which the way I saw it was back in sort of the late 90s, a rebranding of testing because mm -hmm. you got paid more as a quality assurance expert as mm -hmm. opposed to a software testing expert back in, back in the late 90s. Um, and then we pivoted over to quality engineering to add in the notion that a lot of things that go on to testing, the mm -hmm. big umbrella of testing's plate, are the things that are not directly typing keys to develop the app. I see. So configuration management, and it kind of falls under testing. DevOps and sort of your pipelines and continuous integration, well, the devs don't have time for that. Uh, surely those testers have time to do that, right? Surely the QA people have time to do that. So this engineering notion of engineering the system has come out, but also there's an aspect of a larger contingent of, of the people in the industry understanding grudgingly or not grudgingly that, hey, you know what? When those guys like Paul and Scott and, and other people talk about you know, when you develop this, this, this automation, whether it's for performance testing or, or, or for software, just functional testing, that really is software development. Right. And we have to treat it that way, and then we extend that into the engineering notion. So uh, some of this is obviously colored by my experience. I've not done any deep uh, research into those terms, but that's sort of what I've seen anecdotally over the years. So you mentioned that uh you started in the 90s, late 90s. I started in the late 90s myself. So we've kind of, in that generation, we've seen so much. We're now currently in 2023. Um, we've moved from monoliths to microservices. We've moved from uh, on-prem to cloud. We've moved from all these things. We, and, and things have gotten more complex. And, but surely, surely, we have our act together. 
now in 2023. There's no more problems. Quality's taken care of, right? So yesterday, <laughs> yesterday, literally yesterday, uh, I, I had to sign up for an account and it made me go through, I don't know, six or seven different captures. And on the last one, when I hit the verify button, it froze. Did an update, the button didn't go blue, the button stayed gray, and nothing happened. So I hit refresh, and then there was another submit button. So I hit the submit button. Nothing appeared to happen, and the button was still lit. So I'm looking and looking, everything looked fine, looked fine. Me being me, I hit the submit button a bunch out of frustration <laughs> and curiosity, and I got 12 emails saying, oh, look, you're signed up for this thing yeah. now. So no, we don't have our act straight. And, and the core question is, well, what's changed between when we started 30-ish years ago to today? Everything's changed, yeah. and nothing's changed. I give a talk called um, Playing the Automation Tool Selection Game. And the reason I started was I kept seeing all these questions on the LinkedIn groups. What's the best tool for this? What's the best tool for that? Blah, 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 blah. I blew the dust off that talk last year, and I said, this seems still relevant. Let me go check. So I looked in the LinkedIn groups. Same questions are there. Mm -hmm. Different wording, slightly different. Hey, what about for this OS or for this app type, you know, for Maui or whatever? Same questions are there. Why? And it's because of something, that, well, partially because something you and I talked about earlier where people our age, we've moved on to other things. We're in management or we, we were realtors, right? Because of the... the uh, the late or the early 2000s when um, well the dot com bust but there was mm -hmm. another one later on there the housing market and all right. that people said I'm done with tech tech is too fickle I'm going to go be realtors and insurance salesmen and stuff um, so we have this new set of people coming in that haven't learned all those lessons yet and they look at some things and say oh well wait we got software to do this testing now. We've got software to do this other stuff now. We'll just use that software. And they don't treat it as software, right? Mm -hmm. So they start treating it like magic, like a wand. They can wave over and sprinkle some dust and say, it's tested now. And we get into the same places that we were before with new people, with new technology. So it all looks like a new problem because now we have mobile OSs and we've got IOT, we've got watches that connect to the moon and stuff like that. But at its core, it's the same kind of problem. We've created something that we need to check and see, does it work sufficiently? Mm -hmm. Everything else is important, but it's merely important at that point. The core is, do we have something that's sufficiently valuable for our users, our customers, and our clients? Mm -hmm. And that kind of gets obfuscated sometimes by some of the sparkle and the squirrels that we see around. But are they, are, are the, is the new generation, the new college grads that learned different programming languages than we did, et cetera, et cetera, um, do you think that they're losing so much context and that's the reason why we still have problems? Or just that the problems keep changing and it's just changing the wheels on a moving bus all the time? I mean, what is it because we are missing something. There are some huge gaps there. Where are the gaps that keep us from having great quality software all the time? I think there are a couple of gaps. And one is you kind of touched on is the education is different. For my first six or seven years of my career, I was more tightly bound into what the universities were, were, um, were churning out as far as, as, as catalogs and content and education and stuff because we were hiring so many new grads and I was either a manager or I was helping uh, managers screen candidates and stuff. So I had a much better idea of what they were doing. And even which schools, I'm like, oh wait, person from that school, let me bring so-and-so over here to talk to them because they went to the same school. They'll know what the hard teachers were and what the hard courses were and, and stuff like that. So you could get a better barometer of that. It's not that college has fallen out of favor, it's that we have other places to learn technology these days. And a lot of technology is a lot more approachable, which is a good thing because you can go to a community college or go to a boot camp or even learn on your own and become a developer or a tester or a, a, a DevOps engineer, for lack of a better phrase right. for that. Um, so yes, there might be some context missing there because you're learning 
the, they learn how to turn the crank, mm -hmm. which is valuable, which is needed, right? We still need software for quite some time. But the context of why certain things happen and don't sometimes might be missing depending on the student, depending on the program, depending on lots of different things. So there's that part of the context. Uh, the other part of the context that I think is, is missing, and we talked about a little earlier, is that the context hasn't changed. It looks like it's changed, and important parts of it have been extended or added to, but again, at its core, is what we're creating fit for purpose. Mm -hmm. And I think it's easy to lose sight of that. I think it's easy to look so much at getting something out the door, time to market, beating, you know, I'm, I'm Target, I wanna be Amazon, and I'm, I'm Amazon, and I wanna be Walmart, and, and getting that feature out, and getting that price lower, cutting that margin, figuring out how close can I get to where people just revolt against mm -hmm. my app or my product or my company. We've become a lot more tolerant as a society of failures in our stuff. Mm. So think back to when you were growing up, 70s, 80s, whatever, if you picked up that phone and you didn't get a dial tone within a second or less, there was something wrong with that phone and your parents were probably calling the phone company going, there's something wrong with my phone. Mm -hmm. if, that, if that call dropped, the phone company was definitely getting a call. Now, cell phones, today, I had someone in my house saying, yeah, you're breaking up, you're breaking up. I'm standing still, how can I be breaking up, right? 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 To go back to the old Seinfeld, people are complaining about their call quality and they're dropping calls, but your call's going to space and then right. coming back down, yeah. right? So we've gotten tolerant and going, oh, this stuff's complicated, eh, it's gonna happen, it's a glitch. Think about um, uh, healthcare.gov. Oh, there was a glitch, right? No, it was an outage, right? right? <laughs> it, it was a performance outage right. and some functional outages, but a lot of it had to do with performance. And there are a million reasons why things did and didn't happen there. I don't want to get into that. But what I want to get to is we've minimized it even. We don't say bug. We don't say issue. We don't say defect. We say glitch. Mm -hmm. That's what's in the news. There was a glitch because you could put the word just in front of glitch. It was just a glitch. You can't put were just in front of outage. It was right. just an outage. It was just a catastrophe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it was just an outage. <laughs> Along those same lines, uh, now being in 2023, and, and a lot of companies have moved and adopted the DevOps culture, QA sort of getting sucked into dev. Right. Um, do you think that the SDETs and the, and the SREs, site reliability engineers and software developer uh, engineers and tests, replace just in title, but also in function, the quality engineers, functional automation engineers, performance engineers, load testing um, professionals, uh, what we always called ourselves when we were doing that. So do we work alongside them or do we get sucked into those titles or how does, what do you feel about that? Well, let's put Dev in there too. We just have one person do all the things, Yeah. right? So it, it's not a, it's not necessarily a depth or, or, or any sort of capability thing. It's a bandwidth thing. Yeah, it's not that they're stupid. It's just that right, but, it's but, a time but even issue. If, if, exactly. So even if I wave my, my own, again, I love this magic wand thing, right? <laughs> so if I wave a magic wand over me and I go, I'm now an Azure DevOps pipeline guru. How am I gonna have time to do my dirty fingers automation architect job, mm -hmm. right? Where I'm helping with strategy, coaching teams, writing some code, helping debug, right? And building and maintaining pipelines for the whole system or even for the, the QA part, right? The, the testing part. Yeah, maybe that falls into my lap, maybe it doesn't. Um, I, I have a, a guy I used to work for, a um, friend of mine named Moscono, still waiting for this talk, <laughs> man. But he talked about putting a talk together that was about the changing role of the QA person, right? First you were a tester. Then you had to become a little bit of a programmer if you're going to work in the automation world. And then, well, we don't have time for scrum mastery with the devs. The devs are far too busy with what they're doing. So now you're the scrum master. And, uh, oh, wait, there's this DevOps thing now with this continuous integration. So now you're going to build out that pipeline for us. Um, it turned into our career path was all things not app dev. Mm -hmm. And in the case of SDET, working with some people now who 
their term of S debt is, oh, by the way, you can work in the app code as well, mm. equally comfortably across everything. Okay, those people do exist. Bring your wallet, mm -hmm. but they exist. But how are they gonna do all the jobs concurrently? Because a lot of that work does happen to have to happen concurrently. You can say, all right, all my people, I just got rid of all my automation testers and I brought in s debts. I got the cash, but I didn't need as many now. But where'd all the work go? Mm -hmm. Did the s debts work twice as fast? Okay, well, maybe, but every one of them worked twice as fast as, as every, or three times as fast as everybody. The amount of effort is still there. Mm -hmm how you divide up the effort. Does it make sense to have a bunch of generalists and no specialists or all specialists and no generalists? The right answer, the appropriate answer is gonna be context dependent and it's gonna vary from team to team to team, but most likely it's probably some of all of that. Mm -hmm. I had a client where um, we're going in, helping out with automation, some of it was, was web browser-based automation and they didn't have good locators for the for the, the, the tool to go and hook on consistently. They bought in, they're like, yep, 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 all our new code, we're gonna add these in, but we don't have time to go back and do the old code. Mm -hmm. I said, well, hey, a couple of these guys on my team, yeah, they're automation engineers, but in a previous life, they were app dev. Can they go in and do the work? Oh yeah, that'd be great. Now you had to pick me up off the floor because I've <laughs> never, ever, ever heard, yes, that would be great. Um, or even a grudging fine. It's always been, no, 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 we're devs. We're, right. We got the dev thing going on. Um, so, can it be done? Sure, but everybody has to understand that the quantity of work isn't going away. Sure. The number of distinct skill sets might change, and you're amalgamating them in, in one single human being or a subset of the number of human beings you had before. That works going somewhere, mm -hmm. or it's not getting done. Okay, so last question, yep. most important. Yep. Metallica or Megadeth? Ooh, that's really an album by album comparison, but I generally fall on the Metallica side. Um, for the first half of the career, for the back half of the career, it's a mixed bag. Uh, I really like some of the me the newer Megadeth yeah. records and, and better than the newer Metallica records, but if it's really a... A, a I'm one, sorry to tell a, a you one, that's one that the wrong answer. Was, I understand. It was Slayer, so <laughs> just letting you know. <laughs> the answer's always Slayer. <laughs> thanks, man. Thanks for being on the hey, show. Hey, thanks Appreciate for having me. It's always fun. <laughs> always great to hear sage advice from our buddy Paul. So where do we go from here? Wherever it takes us. And wherever we need to go to find those people who know how to bring solutions to the table. So that's my quest. I'm Scott Moore. Thank you for joining me for DevOps Driving. I hope you'll join me for another episode soon. Until then, let's be DevOps driven and let's head on down the road.